introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to this workshop. It's a pleasure to be here, even if I, I'm more mathematically orientated. But I hope that I can, can, can convince you that mathematics is sometimes helpful to improve statistical technology. Uh, so I'm talking about optimal designs for comparing curves. This talk is very closely related to Frank's talk. Yeah, he will not talk about optimal designs. He will talk about better tests, which I will investigate. So he will improve my tests. I will talk about optimal designs, improving a particular test which is currently used in statistical practice. So my work is based uh, on joint papers with uh, Maria Constantino and Kirsten Schorning, both from Bochum. Um, and uh, that's what we are going to do. I give you some motivations. So the motivation is very similar to the motivation that Frank gives. I actually steal some transparencies of him, uh, extended it. Then I talk about testing for similarity. Um, I talk about optimal designs for comparing curves. So everything is related to the establishing the equivalence of two curves. And then I talk about some kind of robust designs. Um, Bayesian designs, if you like, and then I will draw some conclusions. So here are four motivating examples why a comparison of curves might be interesting. So the first one is uh, that you have different populations from different geographic regions, and the objective is that you somehow want to extrapolate information from one population to the other. Okay, and so if you, and then this might be interesting to demonstrate that two curves, for example, dose response curves for one population and for the other population are somehow similar. And the second one is somehow also related. So you have two dose response relationships. And for example, once daily treatment and twice daily treatments. And you want somehow to establish the similarity of these two treatments. The second one, the third one is more challenging. Most of you might, might know about bioequivalence. So if you compare different drugs containing the same active substance and you want to claim bioequivalence, then you know, some of you know that most traditional measures are based on area under the curve or Cmax or on both. Okay, and of course you can have two curves which have the same area under the curve and the same max, but they look, can be, look quite different, like these ones here. So they, these are some extreme cases. And it might be better to compare the curves directly instead of comparing some kind of real values measures that you draw from these curves. So, so it might be better to compare these curves directly instead of comparing the AUC and the C max, okay? Because they are both, for both curves, they are the same. Uh, but the curves are not the same, obviously. I know that this is a very strange example. It's uh, somehow provocative. Okay, the third, the fourth example is uh, drawn from some joint work which we are currently doing with the European Medicines Agency. It's about the comparison of dissolution profiles um, where you have some in vitro dissolution profiles uh, for, from a test reference in the product. You measure at different times and the people from investigating dissolution profiles, they actually want to see if the profiles are the same. And they have some very strange measures derived from maneuver and some, yeah, I would say some classical statistics, but they somehow ignore completely the relation of the curve. So it might be better to compare these two curves directly instead of drawing some kind of maneuver measure. It's called F2, and then they have all kinds of arguments if the, two, if the two quantities F2 from one population and the other population are the same, they argue that the dissolution profiles are the same, but it, uh, it might be better to compare these curves directly. Okay, so that's my motivation for things. So all what I'm saying is not related to those response curves or anything, it's just related to the comparison of two curves. You just want to see if two curves are somehow similar. Nevertheless, I will always rephrase to those response curves in order to keep uh, things more focused, but the methodology is generally applicable. Okay, so here are two dose response curves from different populations. Frank is always saying European and Japanese. And we want to know if these two curves are similar. Obviously, these curves on the two pictures are not so similar, but they could maybe look more similar if you uh, have different data. 
And if they would be similar, then we could somehow try to extrapolate data uh, information from one population to the other. Okay, so these curves are not so similar. Of course, you have to define similarities somehow. Okay, so this is a mathematical model. We have two groups. We have two parametric nonlinear regression models. Very simple. In each group, we take uh, ni observations. I will make this more specific. I specific. Oh, this was too quick. I, I, have some, I assume some normal distributed error, which is not really important, uh, but I'm a mathematician, so I always make things very specific. You don't forget about that. We have these unknown parameters here, and then we have a design space, which I usually call dose range, but in the design of experiment literature, we call it design space, okay, because we are, uh, we are allowed to, take the, to, 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 to choose the dose levels later on, okay? So that's the reason why we call it design space, because we somehow design an experiment by choosing the different dose levels to, uh, which we use for allocation to the patients. Okay, did I forget anything? No, I make that more precise later. Okay, so the problem now is we have these two parametric regression curves. We don't know the parameters. We estimate the parameters. We want to somehow to conclude that the curves are similar. I already mentioned. If, they, if we somehow could conclude that they are similar, we could uh, transfer information from one curve to the other. Okay, and there is a procedure for doing that. I will describe that in very much detail later on. And we are interested in optimal designs for that procedure. Okay, and uh, uh, in order to minimize the sample size, because this research is funded by the Ideal Project, which uh, is the logo at the beginning of the transparency. It's a specifically program from the European Union for integrated design and analysis of small population group trials. So that's our funding. It's the same funding as Stephen uh, mentioned. So we are in the same grant, yeah, but we're doing rather s different things. Okay. All right. So let's make it more clear. So we have some kind of metric measuring the distance between these two nonlinear regression curves. Okay, you can take any metric. I will make it specific uh, later on. And uh, then we, or it's actually not my idea, so people in the literature, they phrase, they somehow formulate the hypothesis of similarity in the following way. The distance between these two curves is larger or equal than a threshold delta. You have to specify the threshold. And the alternative is that the distance between these two uh, curves is less than a pre-specified threshold delta, okay? And, and we put this in the alternative. People who know bioequivalence uh, know why, because we want to decide for similarity at a controlled type one error. Okay, that's the reason why we put it in the alternative. Okay. And in this talk, we just look at the maximum difference. The maximum difference is actually uh, yeah, very easy to interpret. And it's also mathematically the most interesting one. Okay, so if we look at this one. Okay, here's a picture, so it's not very difficult. So, what is the, so we have two curves, two typical dose response curves. One is a well known Emacs model, and the other one is a log linear model. Okay, and we have these two curves. I draw, you see that on the figure. Okay, and then you just calculate the maximum distance, which is the maximum, or it takes the maximum dis vertical distance between the two curves over the x range. Okay, okay so it's a very easy thing. Okay, all right. So there is, I mentioned it before, there is a test for similarity which was developed uh, six years ago or seven, uh, probably it has been developed earlier, but it was published uh, six years ago by Gesteiger, Frank Breitz, and Liu. And I will describe this test in detail because we, uh, I will show you that tests, uh, uh, if you don't use appropriate designs, it has not much power, okay? Um, so what the people do, it's a very simple but intuitive idea. They construct a confidence band for the difference of the two regression curves. Okay, we have these two regression curves. We can estimate these parameters, and then we can construct a confidence band for the difference of these two curves. Okay, and then they look at the rectangle Cartesian product with the, with the interval minus delta delta. And 
they basically reject the null hypothesis, so they decide for similarity if the confidence band is in this rectangle. Okay, this, is, this was a very precise mathematical description, but it's very easy to see. It's a picture. So here are two hypotheses. So we want to investigate if the difference between the curves is larger or equal than delta, uh, equals one. And the alternative is that the distance is smaller than one. Okay, so we construct a confidence band for the difference of the two curves. The confidence band is given here. This is the curly line. This is the upper band, as the upper line, and this is the lower band. So the true difference between the curves is this probability, I forgot, I think it's 95% between the upper line and the uh, lower li solid line, okay? We have this threshold delta equals one here, okay? And you see the true confidence band is contained in this rectangle, design space Cartesian product minus delta delta. So we decide for similarity. So we reject H zero, okay? On the right, so hand side from, yeah, from, yeah, you see, the conf we have a different setup. The confidence band is not contained in this rectangle. So the upper, bar, the, upper uh, the upper line of the band exceeds the threshold delta. So we decide that we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So it's very simple. Okay, you can prove that the, uh, the test has at most level, so as it has asymptotic level alpha, you can, it's very easy. Okay, all right. Okay, so, uh, so I want to um, propose some improvements of that test with respect to a design perspective. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to construct optimal designs which minimize the width of these confidence bands. Okay, so you will see, we will, we will understand hopefully that the, these bands depend on the design of experiments. So how you choose your dose levels. Yeah, I will explain that a little later. So if you make these bands more narrow, you have a high, so you increase the power of your test because you, it's likely that you reject more often. Okay, so, so, we, what, what, so, the, pro, so the goal in this talk is to make these bands more narrow in order to reject the null hypothesis more often. Okay, so, and we will do that by choosing uh, an efficient design, and it's, called, it's based on a paper in the Annals of Statistics, so it's a, it's a very theoretical journal, but it has many, so I, will so I will not talk about the theory too much, so we talk about the applications of these results, okay? The idea is to minimize the width of the confidence band by the construction of good designs, because if it makes the binds, bounds more narrow, it's more likely that we reject, okay? This will increase power, and it will increase power by a factor of 50, I would say. Okay, so I will demonstrate that later. Okay, compared to a standard design. Okay, so I want to emphasize this is not a standard design problem. That's the reason why we got it published in the analyst. So it has never been. So it's not standard. You will see. Okay, so if we want to achieve these goals, we have to take a more closer look at the test. The test is very simple, but I now have to describe it a little more detail in order to explain what we're doing. So, so more details for this test. So we have two designs for two samples. Okay, we usually write it in the design literature as a matrix. So the matrix in the first row of a matrix, so this is the design for the first sample. This is the design for the second sample. In the first row of this matrix, we actually put the dose levels. Okay, so these are the X11, X1, L1. So these are the points where we measure. So the dose levels where we allocate patients to. Okay, so, and in the second line, we put, we put uh, the proportion of patients allocated to the particular dose level. Okay, so let's give a summary. So NI is the sample size of the I sample, uh, for, for, for group I. LI is the number of different dose levels. For example, if, if we take five different dose levels for the first sample, LI is five. XIJ is the J's dose level in sample I. NIJ is the number of patients treated to dose level, to, uh, assigned, uh, no, that's uh, wrong, this should be deleted, assigned to dose level I, uh, XIJ, and NIJ divided by NI, it's not a difference, but I will, you will see later that it's 
better to write it that way, is the relative proportion of patients assigned to dose level I, uh, Xij. Okay, so it's just a way we write designs. Okay. Anyway, so now we do some estimation. So we have to specify the estimator. I, I'm, I'm lazy because I put this normal distribution at the beginning. I just take maximum likelihood estimation. So, okay. So we just take maximum likelihood estimation. You can take any other estimate as long as you know somehow the, the, the asymptotic distribution or somehow you know, have information about the variance. So if you do maximum likelihood estimation, then you can basically work out the asymptotic variance and it's not so important. The asymptotic variance has a very complicated formula, but basically the only message that you have to get here is that the asymptotic variance of the maximum likelihood estimation in the first group depends on the design psi one. Okay, so that's my notation here. So the information, so the, the variance, of course, it depends on the variance of the error and on the sample size, but maybe we cannot change this. Yeah. So, but it also depends on the design. Okay, so if you take a, for example, if you take a straight line and measure everything in one point, then the estimator for the straight line will have a terrible variance because you cannot estimate a, a, a straight line by just measuring at one point. So they are very bad designs and they are also very good designs. So the quality of estimates depends on the design. And that's what also what you have to get here. So we, somehow we have mi inverse of psi i and it also depends on the parameter theta i because everything is nonlinear here, and we will get rid of that later on. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's basically everything here from that transparency. And we can, of course, I mentioned it, we can consider other estimates as well, as long as you have some statement about the variance of that estimator. Yeah, so somehow you have to, split, yeah, so that doesn't really matter. Okay, so we have this estimator, and then we can construct a confidence band, it's quite easy. So you learn that basically in statistics one. So if you have these estimators, you, you, have, um, you have also an estimate for the difference of the two curves at a specific point x. Okay, and, and then this is the unknown difference, you don't, you don't know it. Okay, and then you just divide by the standard deviation of that estimate. Yeah, so you just take uh, x bar minus mu divided by sigma hat. That's what I'm doing here. Yeah, so just in a more complicated framework. So this is basically what I wrote down here. And then the confidence band is a set of uh, all cu curves of all values m1, m2, such that this inequality is satisfied. Okay, and an important point here is that's important point is the standard deviation. You can work out the standard deviation for the predicted difference of the two points at the point uh, of the two curves at the point x. Yeah, it's a very complicated formula. You don't have to look at it so careful at the moment. Oh no, you never have to look at it so careful except if you read the paper. But you just have to keep in mind that predicted variance depends on the design again. So it depends on the point where you predict. It depends on the two designs, and it somehow also depends on the unknown parameters, which I have estimated here. Okay, and if you construct the confidence band in that way, the, no, and I also have to take a little bit about, talk about a little bit about this D. You could take the normal distribution quantile, or you can take a bootstrap quantile, actually Brez and Gesteiger and Co. use the parametric bootstrap to get this D here. So, but the message that you should get here is, is that the band, the width of the band at the point X depends on two times D times standard deviation. Okay, okay, and so, and this is the important point here, and the standard deviation depends on CI, uh, Psi 1 and Psi 2, so we can try to make the width of the confidence band smaller by choosing the designs appropriately. Okay, let me give you an example. So we are, here's again the same example that we had before. We have two, the design range, the dose range is the interval 0, 1. And this is the Emacs model and that's a log linear model. So we want to test the hypothesis that the maximum deviation, it's a very strange hypothesis. You see the curves are very close. We want to test if the, that the maximum deviation between these two curves is 2.5. And the alternative is it's less than 2.5. Okay, so we want to use this test of Gesteiger et al. And actually, I think we should uh, reject here, right? Because it's so small. 
Anyway, so what you now get here is, so we have to choose the design. So I choose two st somehow standard designs in this setup. So they are, we took equal locations. At the beginning, we took a f take a few closer dose levels here. So it's 0, 0. 0.5, uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, and 1. And then we take, because we have 100 observations, we take 20 at each of these dose levels. Okay. All right, so what I then did is I, I run a simulation study and constructed the average confidence band, okay, in the, in the average. So this is a co simulated confidence band based on 100 simulation runs. It's this one, okay. Here it's a, this is a zero line and this dash line is the estimated difference, okay. Now we reject the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is, uh, is uh, that the maximum deviation is larger or equal than 2.5. We reject it if the confidence band would be contained in, in this box where the upper level is 2.5 and the lower level is minus 2.5. So it's 2.5, which is somehow here, and we don't reject because it's far above. Okay? So this indicates that the test, if you use a standard design, is very, very conservative. So it even does not detect that, uh, that the distance is smaller than uh, 2.5, although the distance is about 0.1. Okay, so the reason is that we didn't choose a very good design. Okay, so we can do better. And I will explain you how. So can we do better by choosing a nice design? I would not have posed this question if we could not do better. Okay. All right. Okay. So what we're trying to do is... Uh, we somehow have to, let me go back. We somehow, these are standard designs, so they, yeah, somehow they are equidistant in the, at least a part of that point is equidistant on a logarithmic scale. Um, and then the way, the, the, uh, the number of patients is already uh, the same, so somehow they are close to a uniform design. Um, so, what is this? So, in order to do better, we have to somehow choose the designs appropriately. And to do this, I have to make a quick move to some basic facts of optimal design theory. It's uh, not very difficult, but the main trick is that we replace these weights here, which are uh, uh, multiples of one over the sample size of the first group and one over the sample size of the second group by arbitrary numbers between zero and one. Okay, so that's what, all what we do. So we replace these relative sample size by arbitrary numbers of zero, one. So for example, uh, if, yeah, and um, no, I should I explain it a little later. And also we replace the total sample size by the relative total sample size from the first group to the total sample size, first group plus second group, by an arbitrary number lambda between zero, one. And that's called approximate design, yeah? And the reason is, the reason why we do approximate design is that the optimization, so somehow we have to optimize later on something. We have to optimize this minimum width somehow of the, uh, the maximum width of this confidence band small. So we somehow have to optimize the maximum width of the confidence band. It's impossible to do it for these designs because it's a nonlinear, highly nonlinear, non-differentiable discrete optimization problem. So it's the worst thing that you can get in optimization theory. It's, yeah, it's, it's not convex even, okay? So we make the problem convex to get it simpler, okay? And at the end, if we find an optimal design where we have, I don't know, we get an optimal weight here, which is one third, then we do some kind of rounding because if we have 100 observations and we want to and, uh, assign one third of 100 observations to the placebo, we cannot do it because we cannot divide 100 by three, but then we do a little rounding it. Maybe we assign 33 patients to the placebo. Okay, so that's the trick. So we move to approximate designs. And then it's still not easy. So we have to find two designs. Let's assume that lambda one is fixed. Yeah, so, so let's assume that the sample size for both groups is fixed. But we could also, in the paper, we also optimize with respect to lambda. Uh, and I want to mention another one point here. So the, so the width of the poor, uh, confidence interval is proportional to a quantity which I call gamma, which is here. 
it's still very complicated. And I want to emphasize that gamma also depends on the unknown parameters. So, yeah, so that's a problem which I will uh, uh, address later on. So at the moment we assume that we have some information about the unknown parameters. Okay. And um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the maximum width of the confidence band for the difference of the two curves. So we take the maximum of, of the, uh, of the uh, the maximum width with respect to the dose range and try to minimize this. Mathematically, it's this one here. So we take the maximum over the dose range and minimize this. And this is a very complicated expression which you don't have to remember. So anyway, we choose the design such that the worst case gets minimal. Okay. All right. And this problem is still hard. Yeah, even if we went to approximate designs, we have to find the following quantities. We have to find the number of different dose levels. So it's not clear how many dose levels an optimal solution has. Yeah, so it's not, it's open. We have to find the dose levels themselves because we don't know where we allocate, uh, to which dose levels we should allocate patients. And we have to find these proportions of patients allocated to each dose level, okay? Another point is, I already mentioned it, the optimal designs, at least as I formulated in, in right now, depends on the parameters theta one, theta two. The reason why I do this at the po point is that, that it's more easy to understand the basic concept. Yeah, so, it's a, so let's assume that we have some prior information about these parameters. But you can, if you, if you understand the methodology I've pre presented here, you can always extend it to make it, uh, to do, do something different. For example, you can do Bayesian optimal designs. I will talk about that later. You can do standard minimax optimal designs, which I like very much, or you can do, which you like very much and I don't like, adaptive designs, okay? So, uh, so you can extend it. So I stay with, with some, uh, assuming some prior knowledge about the parameters at this point, and these designs are called locally optimal designs because we assume that we have from previous studies or similar studies some knowledge about the parameters. Okay, so, so the, the uh, from, from a mathematician is, uh, is that you, basically you have to find these designs numerically. It's a very complicated optimization problem and um, there's no chance. In the paper we have very nice solutions for interest, for, from a mathematical point of view where we've actually solved these, these, these problems explicitly. Uh, otherwise we would not have published it in the annals. But the models that we consider are not so useful. Yeah, let's say oh, the problems are not so useful. So if you have interesting problems from a practical point of view, you have to find these designs numerically. If you do a numerical optimization, it's not clear that you find the optimal solution. Yeah, because you just put it in the computer. The computer says, well, this is the optimum, but it's not clear that you find the optimal solution. So here I can offer you an opportunity to check if the solution is really optimal. Okay, the idea is very simple. Yeah, because everything is convex. Yeah, so if you, you know that from high school, so yeah, minimize a function of this type, which is convex. Okay, so the only thing that you have to know is if, if, you, if your computer gives you a solution is that the tangent shear, the slope of the tangent is zero. So that's what you have to check. Okay, here it's not so easy because our, our optimization problem is an infinite dimensional one because we don't know the number of those levels, we don't know the, the dose levels themselves, so it's infinite dimension. So the, uh, the checking condition is a little harder, yeah? Just the checking the slope. Of course, otherwise we, uh, I would be unemployed, yeah, okay? So, but nevertheless, you can do a similar thing and derive a checking condition for a more complicated, uh, in a comp more complicated setup. So roughly speaking is, that you, which we call, we call these results equivalence theorem, which actually characterizes the solution. So if you give me a design, if you give me a design, I can work out a function. I don't, don't look at it so well. I, I can work out a function, which is, I call L. Okay, don't look at it so carefully. So I can work out a function, which I call L. And, and then I only have to check the function, if the function is less or equal than zero, and if it's less or equal than zero, it's, I, you have given me the optimal designs. So, okay, so that's the basic message. So I don't go into all these details, it's just, it's very simple. So as a function is here, it looks very complicated, but uh, 
it's, it's well defined and it's, 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 easy, it's easy to put on the computer. So the basic message is you give me the designs, two candidates, which your computer has found. I work on this function L, which is a function of x1, x2. I check if this function is less or equal than zero. If it is, I have, uh, we have found the optimal designs. Okay? That's the basic idea. Let's do that in an example. Yeah? Um, and this, basically, this, this, this condition that's less or equal than zero is basically the same as the slope is zero here in the one-dimensional case. So let's do it in an example. Again, I have the Emacs and log linear model. I have, uh, yeah, we, have, we have seen this picture quite often, so I apologize for that, but I usually try to stay with the same example. So now I put everything in my computer, okay? I end up with two numerically calculated optimal designs. The first one says, well, we should take, use three dose levels for the Emacs model, and the relative proportion of observations taken at each dose level is uh, approximately one-third, okay? The second, for the second sample, we should, for the log linear model, we should use this design, dose level 0, 0.151, 1, and again, the uh, number of, the relative proportion of total observations taken at each dose level is one third. Okay? Now we don't know if these designs are optimal. So what we do is we plot this function. Okay? So we plot this function. This is a plot of the function x, so these are the two design space. We see it's below zero, we know the designs are optimal. Okay? This is basically checking if the slope is zero. It's nothing, no difference, yeah? uh, except that everything is infinite dimensional. So you look at, at many directions where you should, could go down. Okay? All right, so the designs are optimal. Okay, so that's nice. So we have found the optimal designs. Now we, let's see how, what we win. Okay, so that's what we win. So now I have these simulated confidence bands. So you, the blue line is the truth. That's the difference between the two curves. So it's very small. So the red line is the, es this, the estimated difference of the curves after 100 simulations. The upper black line is the confidence. This is the upper line of the confidence band, and this is the lower line of the confidence band. On the left panel, you see the confidence bands that we get from the standard design. I have shown this before. Okay? On the right panel, you see the confidence bands that we get if we would use the optimal design. So they are much smaller, so, you might, so we, we will definitely increase the power because the smaller the, confidence, the width of the confidence band is, the more likely it is that the band is below delta or larger than minus delta. Okay, so you can see that even if you simulate the power. So I simulate now the power uh, as a function of the threshold, okay? And you see now here, the larger the threshold, the larger the power. So if you would use the test of Gesteiger et al. with the standard design, you would see it has no power at all. So it has no power at all. So I hope Frank is not blaming me. So but anyways, there's no power. Okay, but if you use the optimal design, you see that you get some power. Okay, so I hope this is convincing. Let's go on. So now I move on because in all what I have done is I assume prior knowledge about the parameters theta 1, theta 2. Let's see what happens if we misspecify these parameters. Okay, here get another simulation. On the, in the box, we have an Emacs and an exponential model. So this is the Emacs model again, and this is the exponential model. Well, the construction of the design assumes that the parameter theta 1 is 0.2, the parameter theta 2 is 0.7, and so on. So for construction of the design, I assume that these are the true parameters. But of course, I don't know which are the true parameters. So what I done did is I did, the same simu I, I did a simulation using different parameters from the one that I have assumed here. Okay, what, that's what you see here. For example, in, my, in this simulation study, I assumed that the parameters are not 0.12, 0.7, 0.2 as used in the design construction, but they are 0.1, 0.31, so it's just 50% of them. So I just divide everything by two, I just saw. Okay, and for the exponential, I did something different anyway. Okay, and what you see now here is the same picture. So these are, these are the confidence bands that you derive from the, from the standard design. 
the solid lines are the confidence bands that you derive from the optimal designs, even if the parameters have been misspecified. Okay, so this still, you still improve. Maybe not as much, but you still improve. And the same is here. So I doubled every, no, I didn't double everything, but I doubled something. Okay, and you see again, even if the parameters are misspecified, so it really doesn't matter. So you can do better by using the design. So they are somehow not very sensitive with respect to the choice of the parameters. Okay, so that's what I done here. So this is just a repetition here, my curves again. Oops, it was too far. So this is a standard design, and this is a confidence band derived from the optimal design with respect to misspecified parameters. So the conclusion here is we can even achieve an improvement if we misspecify the parameters. Of course, if we misspecify them completely, we will not, might not achieve an improvement. So that's true. Okay, then the next question is, can we even do better if we incorporate the uncertainty about the parameters and maybe also about the models. So it's not clear that you use an Emacs model for the first sample and an exponential model for the second sample. You might want to use another model for the second sample or two Emacs models for both samples. So can we even uh, uh, somehow be robust with respect to the assumption of the model? Okay, and that's quite easy to do. This is, that's what I mentioned, this is standard technology in our optimal design of experiments, or maybe even in statistics. So if you are a Bayesian guy, then you just do the following. So we know that local optimal designs maximize a quantity which depends on unknown parameters which have to be specified in advance. So if we don't want to do that, we can put a prior distribution in these two parameters, say pi 1 and pi 2, and just take, just take an integral with respect to the prior distribution. Then we just average out the uncertainty with respect to the parameters. So that's some kind of standard. Everything getting more complicated, but uh, it's a standard. OK. And so uh, we have seen this is maybe not necessary. I just introduced it because we have already seen that the designs are not so sensitive with respect to misspecification of the parameters. But what's more important is if you misspecify the model, then you really lose a lot. So if you calculate optimal designs for two Emacs models in both sample sites, but use these for exponential models, then you lose a lot. Okay, so that's what I wrote here. So usually the designs are sensitive with respect to the model assumptions. So that's a very well-known fact. So you have to be careful about the model assumptions. Okay, so that's what I wrote here. An optimal design for two Emacs models might be very bad for two exponential models. But we can address model, un model uncertainty as well. Yeah? So assume that you are not sure if you want to take Emacs, log linear, or exponential models. Let's assume we have P models, which are somehow competing. So then you have to choose a model MI for sample one and a model MJ for sample two. You assign for each combination a non-negative weight, alpha ij. Okay, and this somehow reflects your, per, uh, your personal beliefs, how likely these models are. Okay, and then you just do the following. You just uh, do, take the criterion for every pair of models. You take for every pair of models a prior distribution, pi i and pi j, and then you integrate, and then you average over the different models. Okay. And this is more complicated, and that's the reason why I didn't talk to about that so far. But the basic message is that you get the same results as before. You get a, we can construct an algorithm which is calculating these optimal designs, and we can construct a model, a, a, a check-in condition to check if the numerical constructed designs are optimal. So that's the basic me method. But everything is, actually the formulas do not fit on these transparencies anymore. So they are very lengthy and uh, also a little boring. So, but the message is the same. So if you want to be robust with respect to the model assumptions, if you want to be robust with respect to the specification of the parameters, we can do that. We can address that in our methodology. And we can also find optimal designs which are robust. I'll give you an example here. Um, we have three models, so everything is very brief. So we have three competing models, M1, M2, M3, Emacs, exponential, log linear. We have some, some kind of specified parameters which I keep fixed at that model. And let's assume we are interested in a design 
for a comparison of two Emacs models or two exponential models or two log linear models. So in both samples, we want to use the same models, but we are not sure which model we should use. Okay? Then we take for each of these alphas, one, one, two Emacs models, two, two, two exponential, three, three, one third, and we put all other weights equal to zero. Okay? And we fix the parameters because I somehow at least motivated that the results are not very sensitive with respect to misspecification of the parameters. So they are fixed. Okay. Then we can <coughs> work out, no, actually the computer is doing it, the optimal designs, which are here. Now you actually, it's interesting because we don't, I'm not sure about the uh, models. We, it's actually, uh, actually nice. So we use four different dose levels for each sample. So the dose levels are here 0, 0 0.17, 0 0.771, and we have 30%, 30%, 20%, 20% at these dose levels. So, and here the second sample is somehow similar. So we can work that out. I don't, I don't display the shaking condition, but it looks very similar. And what I want to show you now is the following result. So I want to show you how efficient these designs are. I don't define efficiency, but efficiency basically means 100% efficiency is good. Okay, so 100% efficiency. So basically, we measure with respect to the best design which we could get if we are sure that we have two Emacs models. Okay, then, then it would be close to one. Then, so, so this design would have 100% efficiency. So what you see now here is that we also improve the standard design again yeah, um, in all cases. Yeah, so it's much more efficient than the standard design. You could also, ex again, express it in pictures by looking at the confidence bands again. Okay, so I have three more transparencies to go. This, these are the same designs again, but now I want to look at uh, the case. So I have constructed designs for two Emacs models, for two exponential, and for two log linear models. So they are, in both samples are the same. But it might be, at the end, you might be undecided and want to use these designs for an Emacs model and a log linear model in the first and second samples, respectively. So you want to see, I would like to look at the case, how good are these designs for, if you use them for other models, so if you use them for models which are not the same in the, in the first and second sample. Okay, what you see now here is, for example, if I use the new robust optimal design for the log linear and exponential model, we have 67% efficiency. For log linear, we have 89 and we have 69. So it's always better, better than the standard design. So it's always better than the standard design. You can not expect too much because we now have a lot of uncertainty in our specification. We want to be robust against the whole world. So you cannot be particularly good in, a, in one scenario. But nevertheless, we improve the standard design. Okay? And here it's interesting because you might also look, a naive approach would be to look at, at some de-optimal designs for the model. So you could, for example, say, well, I'm, I'm a lazy guy. I know all these de-optimal designs for the Emacs models. So I just use a de-optimal design for the first and second sample. Okay? If you would do that and would, at the end, fit a log linear and exponential model, you would have 2.21% efficiency. It's really bad. Okay? So for the log linear and Emacs, it's better, of course, because we have one correct model here. And here it's again worse. Okay? You see, so, the, so you should not use de-optimal designs in these curves because the design problem is completely different from everything you have maybe seen so far. Okay. So the, here are some conclusions. Uh, so I hope I have convinced you that the problem of testing for similarity is interesting and maybe also fundamental in, in biostatistics. And, and Frank can try it again. Uh, the power of the test of Gesteiger et al. can be improved if you use optimal designs. They make basically the confidence bands more narrow, yeah, such that you get more power. The designs can be constructed such that they are robust with respect to misspecification of the model parameters and also to misspecification of the models. Another message is standard designs are not efficient in this context. So if you would you use uniform designs, uh, they are not efficient. Uh, even worse is if you would say, I have two models, I just, just use the two individual de-optimal designs. They are not efficient for that purpose. You should not use them. Uh, the resulting procedure is substantially more powerful 
then the procedure which used the standard design, but it's still not a good test. Yeah? So the, it's still not a good test. I already indicated it. So it's still, even if you use the best designs in the world, you cannot improve this procedure such that it is very good. I should, I've suppressed some information in my previous simulations. I give you now the reason why. So this was my simulation. It looked very impressive. And uh, so this was the power that you get for the standard design. And this was the power that you get for the optimal designs. Okay? But the true difference is 0.13 in this, this simulation. So we should basically, if we would have a good test, we should reject always. Yeah? And, and you see now we have here very extreme alternatives. So delta is 2 point, 2.0. So it's very extreme. We should not, yeah? So it's not surprising that we, that we reject in this case. So actually we should look. I didn't put it because I took, the, I, took the, I took the table from the paper. In the paper you have to advocate your method. Yeah? So, but basically we should have looked at thresholds maybe 0.5 or something, and then, even, then the test, even with the optimal design, has not much power. Okay, so it doesn't, and then this is basically zero. Okay, so luckily, the next talk constructs a better test. Yeah, so next talk constructs a better test. So luckily, so there's a much better test. So I make some uh, commercial for Frank's talk, so you don't leave. And of course, if I would have time after that talk, I could explain you how we could derive talks, uh, optimal designs for that, talk, uh, for that test as well. So you can do the same with that test, but that's beyond the scope of my talk today, and I thank you very much for your attention. I think I understand you. <laughs> oh, very nice talk, Holger. Thank you. But um, I have one question about robustness because there are two different views of robustness, two different definitions. One is that you, in both cases, you don't know what the right model is when you come to design the particular uh, <coughs> design, when you come to choose the design. In one case, which I think people will usually assume, is they assume that by the time they come to analyze the data, they will know what the right model is. That's true. The more difficult case is when you won't know what the model is. And uh, previous examples I've looked at have the rather surprising and disturbing result that the designs can be quite different for these two cases. It can be quite different if you don't know what the right model is when you come to analyze, because then you actually have to fit some sort of mixture model to the two. And you could say, well, that's not such an important problem, but I would disagree, because actually I would say, how could you not know when you design what the right model is, but know by the time you come to analyze. And the only way you could know is that you've received more information. And that's then a hidden part of the picture which is not covered in the whole thing. So what was not clear to me exactly from your talk is which of the two cases you're talking about. Yeah, that's true. So this is, this is something <laughs> different. So we, we are just, this, 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 uh, this work actually refers to the situation before you have any information or any data available. So, so in this setup, there's no information so far. We just start, yeah. And then, then uh, I don't know your example, but here I'm, I'm not sure in this setup how you would analyze the data later on, right? I mean, so, so can you? So the example I have in mind is the following: it's, it's covered in a, a chapter that Dave and I wrote together. Is to explain the two possible models for No, I think I have clearly defined what I do. So, so th at the end, we fit one model. So that's, that's what I, th this talk uh, actually refers to the situation where we fit at the end one model. Okay, so if you figure mi fit, fit, would fit a mixture at the end of, of these two models, I think I can address that as well, but then I would need another, a different design criterion as well. Yeah, so. No, but you can, I mean, you can, you can make an hypothetical uh, experiment. So you say, well, I, 
I have these three models at the end. So yeah, and so I will, I will, I will fit, fit a mixture at the end of these three models. I actually would not do it, but anyway, you, if, you, if you want to do it, you can do it. And then I, con I could even construct an optimal design for that procedure as well. Yeah, so that's, I'm quite sure, and I think it will work out. Uh, Holger, you mentioned you use a parametric bootstrap to get the critical value. Um, there is a problem with a parametric bootstrap for hypothesis testing. Uh, in, in usual hypothesis testing, when you have nuisance parameters, or, or rather when you have a composite hypothesis, uh, standard theory says you get a null distribution at the least favorable distribution. Right? When you use the bootstrap, you're not getting the least favorable distribution. I mean, the simple way to see that is suppose you have an IID sample normally distributed with constant variance, and you're testing whether the mean is negative versus the mean is positive. The least favorable distribution is when mu is at zero. And, but if you use a parametric bootstrap, you estimate mu to be the sample mean, which is left of zero. So as a result, you'll be simulating your null distribution, not at the least favorable distribution. And as a result, you have a test that's more powerful than a UMP unbiased test. And the reason it's more powerful than a UMP unbiased test is because the parametric bootstrap is not a level alpha test. Yeah, I, I agree completely. So I, I actually, I didn't use that. Okay. Because Gesteigert, I use it, but they, they basically just use the parametric bootstrap because they, they constructed the uniform confidence band. So don't, don't, uh, don't look at that so carefully where it is. I forgot where it is. It should be more here. There. No, where is it? I got lost. Where is it? Where is it? Ah, there, there you point out. They actually, I, I completely agree. Yeah, so, but they, they did it. And that's the reason why, that's maybe one reason why it's conservative, but it's, they, they use the bootstrap to get a uniform confidence band here because it's difficult. If you get a point by confidence band, you could still work with asymptotic theory. And, and then you replace this one here by the, quantile of the normal distributions. And you have a point-wise confidence band, but you still have the same effects with respect to the design. So, so I didn't use it, but Frank will talk a little bit about Bootstrap later on, actually addressing this problem a little bit. Well, my second comment is, I wonder if, if the null hypothesis that the two curves are the same, could you combine them and, and, and estimate a, a common curve and then simulate from that common curve to get an out distribution. Yeah, we have thought about that, but I'm, I'm, I, I somehow, I'm so, I think you can do it, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm somehow having problems interpreting this common curve for two, <laughs> two things. Yeah, so we're also thinking about uh, the case where one population is a subpopulation of the other, and then you basically need some kind of common curve. But I, I personally still have problems to to, to, to have a good interpretation of these common curves. So, yeah, but I think you can. Okay, so, uh, cho so cho to choose an optimal design, you need to the, know the... Could you speak a little louder? Uh, okay, so choose the optimal design, you need to know the... Op op no, I don't understand. So uh, you so just use the micro. So, okay, so choose the optimal design. So to cho choose the optimal design, you no need to know the values like theta one, theta two. So, but they are never known. So how so so so, if, so how do you start? So f f f so you, if I understand your question correctly, you you're asking because I don't know theta one, theta yeah, two. Exactly, exactly. That's that's true. So. So, and you're asking how I start. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, I, here in this case, so I, I mentioned this a little bit later, but, but here it's basically, uh, all the work somehow refers to phase two trials, and somehow we have some, we assume that we have some information about these parameters, but of course, you could also, I, I, as you, you have to use this prior information either to get precise information about what's parameters or some information about the prior distribution. Alternatively, could also try to do something adaptive as well. Yeah, so starting with a small sample, estimating the parameters and then find the optimal designs. But I'm not convinced that this is good in this setup. 
Okay. So uh, I have a couple of uh, queries. So it's an excellent talk. I, I really learned a lot from this talk. Hopefully. So <laughs> at the last slide, uh, last slide, you showed the power table, right? Yeah. So okay. I don't know where it is. Yeah. The last one. Yeah. It's yeah. The last one. So why the when you move from delta 2.5 to 3, why there is a drop in the power? Uh, I don't understand this. Oh yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah, that's because you didn't. Uh, thank you for that question. It's a. Uh, <laughs> Actually, when I prepared this talk, I was thinking that I could present another table that I was asking Kirsten to run the simulations again, but she, I didn't reach her. So, <laughs> so, but, but, so you see, I mean, if data is getting larger, yeah. if data is getting larger, then it's getting more likely to reject the hypothesis. Exactly. So. Okay, so that, that basically, so if you, if, you, if you increase data here, the power should, should increase. Should increase, right. Yeah. Okay, so and what is, what is yet to, now your question? So why there is a drop? Because the delta is three, so for delta 2.5, power is 0.91. Delta is 3, power is 0.86. Oh, but this is just 100 simulations. Oh. That's oh, just oh, 100 okay. simulations. OK, no. OK, OK, OK. okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, if you would have to run 10,000 or something, no, it's just based on 100 simulations. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, OK, I got it. Yeah. So yeah it should increase. Yeah, OK, so that's something. So another thing is that, as I understand, uh, the entire test Procedure is developed based on the maximum kind of distance, something like that. Ma yeah, the maximum. Maximum. Yes, the right. maximum should be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It should be. So, so suppose the the diagram that you have shown, the two curves are very close to each other, but the maximum distance you are taking, right? In this case, yeah, the, the yeah. curves that you have shown. Now consider a situation where one curve is on top of the other, and the distance at each point is exactly same as the maximum, so it's uniformly yeah. higher. Yeah. So is it, so how does, uh, the, what would be the performance of your test, whether it will reject or whether it will accept, because the maximum value might remain the same. Yeah, no, yeah I don't know what's coming out in your particular example, but I just talked about one metric, just the maximum distance, but you can take any other metrics that you want, so, some, some of the, the area between the two curves or whatever, so you can take different different metrics as one. You can even def combine different metrics, say the yeah, maximum yeah. and actually, the area between the two different Yeah, curves, that was right? actually yeah. thinking that. Yeah, uh, yeah. you can do that, but, but uh, then the format is getting even more messy, so I try to keep things very simple, just staying with the maximum difference. But in, in that paper, we don't have it, but in, in the other paper on where we improve these tests, we also have a, a L2 distance between the area and the Yeah, numbers. because uh, tests based on the maximum usually might not have good power, like yeah. sometimes it yeah, will miss, because it's just a single point thing. Yeah. And one very small thing that I, I might didn't understand, that, that in the theorem that you have shown, uh, that yeah, uh, I have one theorem, yes. It's the only it's theorem okay. during it's that conference, yeah? Page 20. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you're very careful. Thank uh, you. So there, uh, it's all right. So here, uh, xi1 star and xi2 star are optimal if the last condition is satisfied, right? Yeah. And uh, so is it unique? So the, the designs? Yeah. Uh, is optimal design? I don't think. That's a difficult question. I would say in general it's unique, but uh, so but for, for these models, but uh, uh, I, uh, for these no models I have considered, that it's probably unique, but, uh, no but I might construct it. models situations where it's not unique. In general, it's not, not clear that it's unique. So, it's, so uh, it's you have, basically, you have to prove that the, 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 the function is strictly convex as I have drawn it here, right? I mean, and that the function is so complicated that it's difficult to prove that it's strictly Yeah, that convex. was, yes, so I was thinking that, uh, uh, yeah, Like that might one have. as well. So, and it's, I, I think for these, for these simple models, uh, exponential, log linear, and, and so on, it's unique. Yeah, but we never proved it because our theory works for any model, and I'm sure that I can construct models where it's not unique. But that's that's a mathematical yeah. exercise, but not very useful. Uh, uh, another small, I'm just thinking, uh, like the curves that you have shown, we can think of this curve as kind of functional data. Oh, yeah. As a curve. Uh, so as we know that uh, sometimes a functional, when, when we deal with this functional data, uh, the gradient or the slope plays a very important role. Yeah. And the, the, the test that you have constructed, especially the h function, uh, this is again a function of the slope of the curve, right? No, no. Is no, a del, del, there is a differential. No, 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 it's more complicated. It's, it's complicated, but. No, no, the, no, it's, the, a, the, it's If you go back to the next slide. No, no, it's basically, yeah, no, I don't think so. So you have. Yeah. There it's is a del del yeah, theta one. That's, that's uh, somehow, 
that somehow uh, uh, this, this, this slope somehow occurs random. So basically what you have is, mathematically what you have is that you optimize a function of two probability measures. So it's, it's, yeah, so we have right. a function right. of two probability. And then this, this, this L function is basically the subgradient of that function with respect to stability. It no, does not have much to do with the, with the slope of the functions. It's, it just ex happens here accidentally. Oh. Yeah, so it, uh, I don't think it's a, uh, I don't think that you can s phrase it in that way. Okay. Can I ask the last question? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. No, no. You can ask me. And later. <laughs> so, so my my question was uh, about the models. So, if if model one isn't nested within model two, then technically the difference isn't zero. For, for any set of values of theta. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you had to adjust your power of the test due to that. Because, I mean, I could be really stupid and pick two models that give me, uh, you know. Okay, so you want to have nested models, that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering why, given that you want equivalence between two populations, why you wouldn't assume nested models. I don't know. So we didn't, we didn't investigate this part for nested models so far. So it's not clear. So I, I think it's open. I think you might also, even, even if you have nested models, all these, it's, it's a little tricky because so if, they, if you have, the simplest case would be, and then you have theta zero as two nested models, right? Just non-effect and, and this Emacs effect, okay? And even here, it's not, so even there, it's not clear to me how to do that. We didn't, we didn't do it so far. Yeah. So it's, it's not clear. But theoretically, the delta could be zero. Theoretically, the delta could be zero. Whereas if I take two unless yeah. theoretically, the difference doesn't have to be zero. Right, that's right. I, 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 we didn't investigate, but at the first glance, I would say that the theory is not, not changing, actually. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, I don't think that this makes a difference. As long as, as, long as the maximum likelihood estimates have this, this is uh, appropriate properties, I guess. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. And we have a half an hour break, and I'm sure we can continue the discussions. Thank you. Thank you.